اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا ابي القاسم محمد وعاله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين واصحابه المنتجبين ومن تبعهم باحسان الى قيام يوم الدين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائهم أجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله جرنا وجركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام I want to briefly recap today as we go into the theme for today. We stated that the word deen in the Quran has come as a singular. And then furthermore, it's explained as deen that is God-centric or deen that is not God-centric. The kuffar and the mushrikeen of Mecca had a very distorted notion of God. Deen that is God-centric is one deen according to the Qur'an. And that is the righteous deen with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept deeds. We stated acceptance of deeds only means that if the righteous deen is followed, then it will be productive. It will assist in the process of self-realization. The reason why it will assist in the process of self-realization is that every human being comes with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God yearns God. Yearning God means to give away ourselves and our inadequacies, our insecurities, our lack and befitting qualities through surrender to God and instead completing ourselves with the positive qualities of God. Deen of Islam means surrendering to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and saying to Allah, I am devoted to you. I am giving myself up to you. It is like Qais saying to Layla, I do not want anything beyond you. You are my goal. You are my objective. The object of love means that the lover gives themselves away and become the beloved. So that only the beloved is seen through the lover. In the deen and Allah al-Islam, deen with Allah is Islam, means the only way to orient ourselves is Islam by giving over ourselves intimately to Allah. Where we say, oh Allah, I'm giving up my insecurity in order to gain security through you. I'm giving away my biases to become as unrestricted as you. I'm giving away my notions of superiority in order to embrace you in your entirety. O oh Lord, I am giving away the gods of the world in order to have you. The head will not bow in front of anyone but you. Let us just explain this a bit more. The Blessed Prophet said, He who fears other than Allah, Allah causes them to fear all else. He who fears Allah, Allah causes all to fear him. The Blessed Prophet said, He who pleases other than Allah, Allah keeps all displeased from him. He who causes the creation to become displeased with him in order to please Allah, not only Allah shall become pleased, but he will cause all hearts to become pleased as well. So deen with Allah means to tend to Allah fully 
where Allah rids the soul of its inadequacies, of its fears, of its insecurities, makes the person godly and godlike and a beautiful soul. Until Allah says, return unto me, O soul, contented with me. This deen has two components. One is the theory, the other is the practice. The theory is God-centricity. Give yourselves away to God. Is the beautiful human morals. The practice is how these beautiful qualities or beautiful theory is formulated, given expression. Pray namaz, go to the Kaaba, fast. Fast is prescribed unto you as it was prescribed unto those before you. You all have your directions that you will turn to. In spite of your directions, seek the good pleasure of Allah and compete against each other in becoming the best of the best. This deen that tends towards God is known as Islam. Islam with the small i. The people who follow this Islam are known as Muslims with a small m. Historically, this Islam and Muslim in the time of Moses called, called themselves Jews following Judaism. In the time of Jesus, they called themselves Christians following Christianity. In the time of the blessed prophet Muhammad, they called themselves capital M Muslim following capital I Islam. That is deen and that is Islam. Just recapping. What is Sharia? Sharia is the expression that this deen of Islam acquires at every different level of human progression. The Sharia merely gives form to that beautiful theory of tending to God, of having those beautiful human morals. That's all the Sharia does. Hence, it is true to say, there has only ever been one deen with Allah, and that is a deen of Islam, turning away from the deities other than Allah, coming to Allah. That is the only deen and that is the only deen that will work. Now, having recapped on all of that very briefly, we now come to the discussion of the Quran. One of the stumbling blocks with the Muslim mind, alongside the ambiguity that exists in the term Islam, in the term deen, in the term Sharia, is with their assumptions of what the Quran is. So Quran is from a divine source. By assumption, it is as eternal as the divine source. It is all-inclusive and it is universally applicable. At this point, I would like to pause and ask you a question. Do you all agree to these assumptions? Yes? 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 Ashabul Yameen, Sabiqun, and Ashabul Yisar. So, Quran is from the divine source. Quran is eternal. Eternity means will be applicable till the day of Qiyamah. All inclusive and comprehensive. There is nothing but that it is in the Quran. Applicable till the day of Qiyamah. Whatever is within the Quran will apply till the day of Qiyamah. If these are the assumptions, then the Muslim is in trouble. Of course, beat your wives till the day of Qiyamah. Cut hands off. Have slaves. Have concubines. Whatever else. Is it eternal? Is it universally applicable? Does it have everything inside it? I go to Australia and I always give this example. Where is the kangaroo inside the Quran? <laughs> Show me. Oh, koala roo. In Australia, they, everything stands, uh, ends with a roo at the end. And I don't know, understand why. But all these different animals end with a roo. Where are all these beautiful creatures within the Quran? It might appear to be a shocking question. How can a speaker say this? 
we need to work through this very, very carefully. I'll take time, but we do need to finish nonetheless. Now, if we look at the Quran and the verses of the Quran, it makes a sharp distinction between Quran and the term kitab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I'll take this slowly, وَعِنْدَهُ مَفَاتِحُ الْغَيْبِ لَا يَعْلُمُهَا إِلَّا هُو وَيَعْلَمُ مَا فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحَرِ وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ Allah has the keys of the unseen. There is nothing within the darkness of the earth. There is not even a seed. There is nothing dry. There is nothing wet. But that it is within the kitabun mubin. Quran does not say it is within the Quran. The Quran says it is within the kitab mubin. Think about this carefully. At some point in my tafsir lessons, I had a group of uh, students and I said, look, the Quran at this point in Surah Zumar says, and we have given every example. I said, does that mean God has given every example? They said, yes. I said, where is the chair and the table example in there? It isn't in there. So what does it mean, every example? There is a lot of naivety in the way we are assuming things and lazily presuming. Look at the next verse. يَمْحُ اللَّهَ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتْ وَعِنْدَهُ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ Allah wipes clean whatever He wants and He makes firm. He has the mother of all books. What is the mother of all books? Then Allah says, إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ It is the noble Qur'an within the hidden book. Here is a distinction between Qur'an and the hidden book. لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَهَّرُونَ None may touch it save the most purified. Does purified means people with wudu? But it's in the hidden book. How can you touch it? Allah makes a comment here. This purity is the purity of intellect and the soul that allows somebody to touch the real book, the real Qur'an. I through mind. Then Allah says again, بَلْ هُوَ قُرْآنٌ مَجِيدٌ فِي لَوْحٍ مَحْفُوظٍ Rather, it is the grand Qur'an in the guarded vault. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a distinction we are seeing between Qur'an and a book. <coughs> Ibrahim makes a prayer. وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ Send within them an apostle, a messenger from them. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ Who will recite upon them your verses. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And will teach them the book and wisdom. So Ibrahim makes a prayer for Allah to send a messenger to the people that will come, his progeny, and to teach them the book. Let's go forward. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَكَدْ آتَيْنَ مُوسَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْفُرْقَانِ We gave Moses the book and furqan, the distinguisher. Allah says again about Nabi Isa, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَالتَّوْرَاتَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ And Allah taught him the book <coughs> and wisdom and the Torah, the testament, and the gospel. We see in all of these verses, there is a distinction between book and Qur'an. They have taught the book. The Qur'an is within a sacred vault. Injil and Torah are being taught. The book has been taught as well. <coughs> then we come to the verse of the Qur'an. ذالك الكتاب لا ريب فيه Now you know ذالك means that but we normally interpret it to mean this that book in which there is no doubt Now tell me when the Quran was being revealed in Medina it hadn't been completed by the time of migration Bakara, Al-Imran, Nisa these are massive surahs they are being revealed now 
They have the ahkam of Islam in them. And Allah is saying, that book or this book, the book wasn't there at that point. The Quran hadn't been revealed at that point completely. So for God to say, Dalik al-Kitab, of course we can legitimately, through the analysis of Arabic grammar, say this book, but literally let's take it as that book. The indication was that there is a book that is being revealed in the form of the Quran. What I'm trying to say here is that there is a distinction between the book and Quran, between the book and Torah, <coughs> between the book and Injil. But at the same time, <coughs> we see the verses. Kul amanna billah wa ma unzila ilayna wa ma unzila ila Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq wa Yaqub wa al-asbat wa ma utiya Musa wa Isa wa ma utiya nabiyuna min rabbihim la nufarriku bayna ahadin minhum wa nahnu lahu muslimun. Say, we bring faith with Allah and whatever has been revealed unto us and whatever has been revealed unto Ibrahim and whatever has been revealed unto Ismail, Ishaq, Yaqub, the children of Yaqub and whatever Moses has been given, whatever Isa has been given and whatever the messengers have been given we do not distinguish between any of them and we stand surrendered to all of them. What does this mean? That whatever has been revealed previously whatever has been revealed to us is one and the same thing. Yet they are different revelations but we believe in all of them. If they were mutually inconsistent, it would not, you can't believe in all of them. So there has to be some consistency. What is in fact happening is that book is an overwhelming reality that is being revealed from time to time with different expressions. At one point, it expresses itself as the scriptures of Moses. At another point, as the scripture of Musa, then as the scriptures of Isa, then as the scriptures of the blessed prophet Muhammad. But it's the same reality that is being sent again and again and again. If you look at it that way, it seems like, in fact, we can give an example. We can say human, and then we can say Ali. Ali is a human. Hassan is a human. Hussein is a human. Such and such is a human, but human is a broader reality than the extensions that belong to humanity. So it's the same truth being revealed again and again in different contexts befitting that context. It is retaining its essence and it is changing in form. Now look at this verse in Surah Zumar. Tanzilul kitab min Allah al Aziz al Hakim. The revelation of the book from the Aziz and the Rahim, from the mighty and from the merciful one. Inna anzalna ilaykal kitab bil haqq. We have revealed unto you the book with truth. So, book is mentioned twice in two verses, one after another. God does not speak anything in vain does not unnecessarily repeat things. But in the first instance, the word tanzil comes. In the second instance, the word inzal comes. Now when we analyze Arabic language, tanzil means sequential revelation. And anzala, yunzilu, inzal means revelation, revelation in one go. We have done tanzil of the book. We have done inzal of the book. In one instance it's saying we have gradually revealed the book. In another instance it's saying we have revealed the book in one go. What does that mean? The book, existential overwhelming reality, is being revealed gradually in accordance with the needs of the human community. But Torah, Injil and Quran are revealed in one go upon the souls of those blessed prophets. And then after that, they are gradually revealed again as the occasion demands. Has that gone through or shall I explain it again? There is an overwhelming book of guidance that Allah says, I reveal gradually. 
I revealed it upon Nuh. Then I revealed it upon Ibrahim. Then upon Musa. Then upon Isa. Then upon you, O Muhammad. And then after that verse, in the next verse he says, I have revealed it all together. Or we have revealed it all together. But there is inconsistency there. In order to bring about consistency, we say that the real communication of Allah is revealed at different stages in accordance with the need of different people differently. Where the salient part of it is God's centricity and the beautiful human values and virtues of humanity. But how are they formulated is revealed differently. So in the time of Moses, there is no relation of Abrahamic faiths that the book will talk about. There is no relation of the community of Musa with other communities. It is a very narrow book as, as opposed to the Quran, which is much broader. So the same reality is being revealed again and again in accordance with different demands. Now if you look at the other verses that are within the Quran, we will see that Quran is being revealed as a part of the book. Look at this verse. Hamim wal kitabil mubin. Hamim and the open or apparent book. Allah said, there is nothing dry or wet, but it is in the kitabul mubin. So here Allah makes reference to kitabul mubin. Hamim wal kitabil mubin. Hamim, whatever that means. By the kitabul mubin, the manifest book. Inna ja'alnahu Qur'anan Arabiyan. We have made it into an Arabic Qur'an. What have we made into the Arabic Qur'an? Kitabul Mubin. When we have revealed Kitabul Mubin to you, we have revealed the Kitabul Mubin to you in an Arabic language. Again, in another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّهُ فِي أُمِّ الْكِتَابِ لَدَيْنَا لَعَلِيٌّ حَكِيمٌ And it is with us in the mother of all books. So this Qur'an is a part of the mother of all books and this Qur'an is a part of Kitab al-Mubin that has been revealed to you in the Arabic language. So if we can understand that, then we can see that no, Qur'an is a contextual expression of the Kitab al-Mubin. Kitab al-Mubin is the eternal truth. Kitab al-Mubin is all-inclusive of everything. Kitab al-Mubin is universally applicable. But when it comes to Torah, Injil, and Quran, they have the essence of Kitab al-Mubin because they are coming from Kitab al-Mubin. Yet, in their application, they are very much contextual. So now here we ask these questions. That is the Qur'an eternal? I ask different questions. That in this Qur'an, we need to look at its content. We will see that the Qur'an talks about the nature of God. This is eternal. The Qur'an talks about God-human relation. This is eternal. Qur'an talks about God-centricity. It's eternal. Qur'an talks about psychology, amalun salih. This is eternal. Quran talks about qiyamah, reward and punishment. This is eternal. But Quran also talks about the personal circumstances of the Prophet Muhammad. Is that eternal? Quran talks about human virtues, eternal. Quran talks about human values that are common, it's eternal. But the Quran talks about the anxiety that the Prophet was suffering at certain points. Is that eternal? Is that universal at the face value level? It's not. The Prophet is distressed at times. Is that eternal? Is that universal? Does that apply to one and all? The answer is no. The Quran talks about the wives of the Prophet. Is that eternal? Is that universally applicable? No. The Quran does not have 21st century examples 
Does it have everything inside it? You will say yes. The pure of intellect will find it. I'm talking about our intellect. intellect. Is it all inclusive of everything? The answer is no. If you look at the Quran and you examine it carefully, you will see that no, there is something else going on. The truth is to be found somewhere else. Now, is the Quran of essence Arabic? The answer is, the book in essence cannot be Arabic. If the truth is within the Gospel and the Old Testament and the Muslim community is made to bear witness that we believe in the Old Testament and in the Gospel, then they are in different languages. Quran in essence has got nothing to do with the Arabic language either. It's the best language, no doubt, by our assumption. It's the best language, but it is not an essential feature of the Quran, nor is it the essential feature of the book, nor is it the essential feature of the truth. If you look at the Quran and its contents, we see many, 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 many things which then challenge our assumptions of the Quran. Where is the eternity of the Quran? In the essence of the Quran. So therefore, the Muslim mind should not be perplexed if somebody says that the Sharia law contained within the Quran is non-eternal. No matter how much we explain that the Sharias fluctuate and change, the meaning of deen, the meaning of Islam, that they're all fluid, the stumbling block is this is the Quran and it's the word of God, isn't it? But the word of God, shouldn't it be in accordance with the handiwork of God? If God spoke in an eternal language, me and you are temporal, we are not eternal. How would we make sense of the eternal word if it was not bound within temporal limitations? There is need for clarity in thought. When we say it's eternal, I am not eternal, my circumstances are not eternal. I need something very much temporal in order to direct me and guide me. This assumption that the Quran is eternal, this assumption that the Quran has everything inside it, this assumption that it is universally applicable, these are the assumptions which are the stumbling blocks. The Quran as a part of the overwhelming essence is eternal. The Quran as a part of the overwhelming essence has got everything inside it. But the Quran is revealed in a context. Now, the Quran was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Quran was revealed in a particular language. The Quran was revealed during particular circumstances. All of these things are limitations upon the Quran. The Arabic language, as eloquent as it might be, is a limitation on the essence that the Quran is trying to convey. Because it's only going to be conveying it in the Arabic language to the flexibility that the Arabic language has. What about the people? The Quran cannot talk of examples of spaceships because those people have to understand and make sense of the Quran immediately. So the Quran will talk in a language that they can understand in the example that they can make sense of. So the Quran talks of what? Of the desert, of the camel. Do you not see the camel, how it's been created? Think about it. How beautifully the camel has been created. But you go to Mars, you're not going to say, are you? To the next generation who takes birth on Mars, do you not see the camel, how it's been created? They say, what's a camel? In the 21st century, you might give different examples. So that context binds the Quran. Marhum Imam Khomeini used to say in his certain of his lectures, that the Quran has been watered down 70 times before it's reached us. What he meant was that the book has been watered down 70 times before it's reached in the form of the Quran. But he used to say that that verse of the Quran, 
that he is the first, he is the last, he is the apparent, he is the hidden, is one verse that suffices us from the rest of the Quran. Why? Because that verse is the essence of the Quran. The rest is but a form to get to that essence. So now the language is a limiting factor. The context of the people is a limiting factor. It talks about the battle of Ahad, the battle of Badr. It talks about Abu Lahab. Tabbat yada Abi Lahab bin Wattab. There is no value to Abu Lahab as such. It talks about Zaid, the son, adopted son of the Prophet. There is no value to Zaid beyond his own context. It talks about a host of things that were happening at that point. We can see from this that the eternal truth has been bound by the context. So there is eternity in there. But it is bound by the context. Now, there is this assumption. Kullun min indillah, every one of them. Verses are from Allah, so all of them are equal. I will ask, are they all equal? The Quran says, There are ayat muhkamat, hunna ummul kitab. There are firm verses who are the mother of the book, which are the mother of the book, ukhra mutashabihat. And others are ambiguous verses. Even God is making a distinction between a verse and a verse. How can the verse, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, be the same as tabbat yada abi bin wa tab? How can they be the same? They are the same because they both come from God or are ordained by God. But how can both of them be same in the depth of the meaning that they carry? We are looking at this phenomenal verse. Wal awwalu wal akhir wal zahir wal batin. Yes? Compare this verse with the verse and when Zaid divorced his wife. How can they be same in their caliber? They are both the same in the sense that they have both been revealed or been ordained as a revelation. But they are not the same in their caliber. What we need to do here is, we need to recheck our assumptions about the Quran. Once we check the assumptions of the Quran, we come out with a far greater understanding of what the Quran is all about. The stumbling block of the Muslim has been this notion that Quran is sacred and not understanding the meaning of sacred. We can say something is sacred, but we also need to understand what is the meaning of sacred. We can understand that something is from God, but we also need to understand that everything is from God and everything is transient. How can something from God be other than in the nature of the rest of the world? If humanity is a transient reality always flowing, fluid, always on the move, evolutionary, then how can the God, how can the word communication of God be stagnant? It came at Torah, as Injil, as Quran. That in itself shows motion and movement, right? The same book is fashioned in three different ways within the Abrahamic faiths. What does that show? It shows that the essence is the same. The forms are fluctuating. You see, the Jewish community faces the same crisis that we face today. They cannot accept the Bible or the Quran because it's the word of God. It's eternal and it's stagnant. See that? How can anything change it? The same is our issue. It's the word of God. So now, as Fallud Rahman says, that kill the enemies of God. He said in order to keep the eternity of this verse alive, you will always have to create the enemies of God in order to fight them. Do you understand that? In order to keep that verse alive, you will always have to create enemies of God in order to fight them. We will always have to have slavery in order to keep the word of God alive. It is not that difficult. It is not a form of heresy, nor is it blasphemy to discuss these things. The person of the Prophet was influential in the way the Quran was revealed. Now I give this example many, many times. Surah Qiyama. It's a phenomenally eloquent surah. Now you will say, Astaghfirullah, how can you say it's an eloquent surah? Aren't all of them eloquent? We will say, obviously, some of them are more eloquent than the others. Why are you finding it so difficult to believe that? If all of them were the same, why is Fatiha known as the mother of the Quran? 
Seriously, if all of them were the same, why are you giving Fatiha such a lot of preference over every other surah? If all of them are the same, why are you saying Yasin is the bride of the Quran? Why are you saying it? If all of them are the same, why are you saying Qul Wallah three times is equal to the whole Quran? Why not Inna Atina? The Quran's hadith itself is saying that certain surahs are different from other surahs. The Prophet boasted that I've been given Sab'an min al-Masani, the Quran, the Surah Al-Fatiha that nobody has been given. And it's the greatest surah ever. Of course there is distinction. So if I say this surah and its eloquence is phenomenal, that is not discrediting the Quran in any way whatsoever. A person with an objective mind will arrive at all of these understandings. Had it not been for the preconceived fear in our heads, we would be liberated people looking at things for what they're worth. I said to this very learned man, I said, you know, fast cannot be 20 hours or 22 hours. He says, that's counterintuitive. I said, what is counterintuitive is that the fast be 20 hours. But what's gotten into your mind is that the fast is connected with sunrise and sunset. And that's why you're saying the obvious thing is counterintuitive. Whereas that's the most intuitive thing that the fast cannot be 20, 22 hours. How can any fast be 22 hours? I said, fast cannot be two hours despite sunrise and sunset. That is not counterintuitive. What is counterintuitive is that fast is two hours. But because falsity has got into the heads, the truth becomes ambiguous. Truth is never difficult. It is very obvious. It just needs a clear mind. When the minds are mixed up, truth becomes confused. That's exactly what happens. You see, when the Prophet came, he came to the Meccans, right? They were clean slates. They hadn't read anything. They were illiterate people. That seed of the Quran germinated very quickly. Had the Quran come to the Jewish community, do you know what they would have done? Because they already had this knowledge and already preconceived ideas, they would have challenged everything about the Quran. That's what happens to us. When a person comes without any assumptions, they understand the truth immediately. But when we have so many assumptions in our heads, the truth becomes mystic, uh, becomes murky and foggy and we can't see it. This is the way things happen. Now this verse, Surah Al-Qiyamah, La uqsimu bi yawmil qiyamah wa la uqsimu bi nafsil lawama Phenomenal prose within the Quran. But you will see, if you read it accurately, that the verses can continue and until to a, part, to a particular extent, and then there is a pause. La tuharrik bihi lisanaka li ta'jala bihi. Muhammad, do not hasten to deliver this Quran. Inna alayna jam'uhu wa Quranuhu. We have the task of gathering it and separating it. Thumma inna alayna bayana. And it is our task to explain it. And then the verses carry on naturally. Why did this happen? Alama Maududi quotes that this is a Meccan surah. The Prophet used to struggle to retain all the verses. So as soon as the verses would come, he would say it out quickly. Isn't this all strange to listen to this? Isn't it all so strange? Because our ears are not accustomed to listening to these things, right? So the Prophet would hasten to give it all out. So when the revelation observed the state of the Prophet, immediately there was a pause and a personal conversation began with the Prophet. لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به Oh Muhammad, do not hasten to deliver it. Don't worry, we will gather it, we will protect it, we will explicate it. Don't, uh, don't be in such a stressful state. And in another place Allah says, ما ننسخ من آيتنا وننسيها We do not abrogate a verse, nor do we cause it to be forgotten, but that we bring a better verse, Oh Muhammad, be at ease. This was the humanness of the Prophet. If you read the Quran, you will find that the human context is the limiting factor of the Quran. The eternal, beautiful essence has been fashioned within a context. So when I talk about the Quran, I say it is divine communication within a human context. Me and you are divine handiwork. 
or within the worldly context. There is eternity within us, yet everything of us is temporal. It's fleeting, dying, moving. Nothing is stable, is there? The only stable feature in us is the spirit of God that is returning to God. And that stability is in motion. So it's divine communication, but within a human context. Now tomorrow we're going to work more at this thing. And inshallah bring out further meanings. But I just want to repeat this. Quran is a part of the eternal book. The eternal book is the existential book. The Quran, even if it has everything inside it, it has everything inside it indirectly. It cannot be accessed by one and all. لا يمسه إلا المطهرون This book, which is in your context, has indication of everything inside it, but it requires the refined of intellect to get it. But you know the surprising thing is, the Quran says, even the Prophet cannot understand the fullness of this Quran. لا يعلمها إلا الله وأخرى متشابهة لا لا يعلم تعويلها إلا الله and full stop. Now I know the Shia say that the full stop shouldn't be there, but Allah Matabatabai all say no. That's the full stop, natural. None knows. The fullest extent of its meaning except Allah and that stands to reason because only Allah knows what his knowledge is. Not even the blessed prophet can know what the knowledge of God is. Otherwise there would be no distinction between the blessed prophet and God. Right? If there was no distinction between the blessed prophet and God, the blessed prophet would not say, Wala alamul ghaib. I don't know the unseen. Prophet says that, right? God, prophet says that in the Quran, I don't know the unseen. I don't know what will be done to me or to you. Had I known the unseen, I would have reaped the benefits and no evil would have befallen me. The blessed prophet admits to his inability to access fullness of knowledge. Yes? I only follow what has been revealed unto me. Allah says, Allah wipes clean what he wants and he makes firm and he has the mother of all books, nobody else. So the Quran is a reflection of the book within a given human context. It has eternal truths inside it. It has everything of the book inside it but within that limited form. None save the most purified intellect can access the book through the Quran. For the rest of us, we look at the apparentness and try to find out as much as we can. But we admit that these assumptions that it is eternal only means eternal in essence. In the verses of God, God-world relationship in the verses of salvation, in the verses of virtuous existence, in the virtues of common human values, for example. It has everything inside it. The book has everything inside it. The Quran has everything inside it for the consumption of the 7th century community. It is applicable for all eternity, applicable for the people who are there immediately. The book is applicable for all eternity not its formulation in the way of the Quran. So now when somebody says that in the present day, we cannot cut people's limbs off, it is not going against an eternal word of, the God, of God. It doesn't mean that at all. If somebody says that the shares of inheritance can be rediscussed, it's not blasphemy or heresy. It's not going against the Quran. It's not undermining the Quran. It's merely saying that that part of the Quran was a formulation of an eternal essence. Deen is essence and God's centricity in human virtues and what? Formulation. The Quran consists of both. Bring two male witnesses. And if you fail to bring two male witnesses, then bring one male and two females. If one were to forget, the other one can remind her. What if the one doesn't forget? You don't need to. 
I'll construct this argument again in a much simpler form. Khalif Abu Bakr made a huge mistake and a blunder in taking Fadak away from Bibi Fatima. It's a blunder. No doubt it's a blunder. With all due respect to everybody, it's a blunder. Yes? Because Khalifa Uthman, if Khalifa Abu Bakr's uh, action was Sunnah, then Khalifa Uthman went against him. Yes? And then later on, the others went against them as well. So this is a huge blunder. We know this. So now, he asks Lady Fatima to bring another witness in accordance with the injunction of the Quran. Imam Ali says to Khalifa Abu Bakr, he said, you're going against what the Prophet has said. The Prophet has said, Fatima is Siddiqa. She will never make a false claim. And you know that. So Imam Ali is saying to Khalifa Abu Bakr to go against the Quranic injunction. Can you see the implication of it? And Khalifa Abu Bakr admits that he's doing something wrong by asking Lady Fatima to bring another witness. But Khalifa Abu Bakr does not substantiate his point and prove that it's in the Quran because he knows the Quran does not mean that. The Quran has to be pragmatic. Pragmatic means it has to apply immediately within its given context. The Quran takes heed of the context, its strength and its weakness, and in accordance with that, formulates itself. So for today, we will say this much. That when we talk of the law of the Quran, that part of deen, and we say that it has to now be reformulated in accordance with the essence that the Quran is giving, this is nothing against Islam or the Quran or the sacredness of the Quran. It is well within the Quran itself. It's keeping with the Quran. It's not going against the Quran. Yes? So for example, I'm just going to give this example. The essence of that verse was accurate testimonial. Two women, if one were to forget, the other one can remind her. What's the essence? The essence is accurate testimonial. If you know there is this woman who does not forget anything, like the 21st century women, then get 10 men or one woman. <laughs> because men can forget, conveniently, women do not forget anything. And then, of course, we're going to explain later on about relativity as well. This is what I wanted to say for today. Imam Hassan had several sons that were all martyred within Karbala. But there's a very heartbreaking scene. Imam Hussein is outside his tent. He used to come back to the tent and he used to cry out, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Why did he do this? Because he knows that his Zainab's heart is filled with anguish. So several occasions he used to return to the tents and cry out, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah so that Zainab would hear that my brother is still alive. On an occasion, they come behind him and they start fighting him outside the tents. He has fallen from his steed on this occasion. The cloth of the tent lifts and there appears a 10 or 11 year old son of Imam Hassan. He looks at Imam Hussein and he sees somebody raising his sword about to strike Imam Hussein. He cries out, Why do you kill my uncle? Imam Hussein looks at him. He starts running towards Imam. Zainab appears. Imam Hussein cries out, Ya Zainab, Ihbisihi. Oh Zainab, grab him. The boy escapes. He comes to Imam Hussein, and the sword descends upon the child's arm. It cuts his arm off. The child cries out, oh, uncle, they've severed my arm. Imam Hussein grabs him to his chest, and an arrow is shot within the tender chest. As the boy flutters, Imam Hussein says, like this, oh, child. Shall we be raised in front of your father and grandfather? Qasim is 14. 
He comes to Imam Hussein and he says, allow me and permit me. By the standards of the day, Hazrat Qasim is baligh and is able to take this decision. But we find a narration that on the night of Ashura, Imam Hussein examines his family and his followers for their loyalty. Hazrat Qasim at that point says, Oh uncle, shall I also be of those who are honored with giving their lives for you tomorrow? Imam just stared at him. And he said, Qasim, how do you find that? And he said, for you, ahla min al asal. For you, O Hussein, I find it sweeter than honey. Qasim comes to Imam Hussein. He says, Uncle, allow me with a very heavy heart. Imam Hussein allows Qasim. Hamid ibn Muslim says that Imam Hussein tore his turban in two, and it was of black cloth. One piece he places upon the chest and the back of Qasim. It appears that Qasim did not have the coat of mail because he was too young. And another one he tied around the head of Qasim because he could, did not have a helmet and placed it from under his neck. Hamid ibn Muslim says that Qasim's sandal was broken. And I saw the feet of Qasim, they were not reaching to the stirrup. As Qasim appeared within the battlefield, they said it was as if the crescent was appearing. The reason why they said this was because the turban on Qasim's face fell to his forehead and that cloth from underneath his face was covering half of his face and whatever was available looked like the crescent. Qasim goes into the battlefield. I heard this and I've heard this, that Hussein stood on top of the hill with Abbas. Umar ibn Sa'd looks at Qasim. Hamid ibn Muslim narrates how much his mother must love Hussein that she has sent him to the battlefield. He looks at Azraq, the renowned warrior. He said, Azraq, finish him off. Azraq said, he said, it's an embarrassment for me, Omar. He is a child. Let one of my sons go and finish him off. Azraq sends one of his sons. Hussein looks at the son of Azraq, also a renowned warrior. Inadvertently says, oh Allah, my Qasim is a child. Help my Qasim. Qasim puts him to that. Azraq sends another one of his sons. Qasim puts him to that. Third and fourth when they die, Azraq in a rage arrives into the battlefield. Inadvertently Hussein looks towards the heavens. He says, oh Allah, my Qasim is but a child. He is hungry and thirsty. Allow him victory over Azraq. Break his arrogance, O Lord and I will collect the pieces of my Qasim's body. Azraq appears within the battlefield. Qasim puts him to that. Umar ibn Sa'ad says, await not, finish him off. They surround him as they cut him into pieces. He falls to the ground. One of the soldiers deliberately tramples upon the body of Qasim. Qasim calls out, O oh, uncle, come to my aid. Hamid narrates, like a lion or an eagle descending to its prey, Hussein arrives within the battlefield as they disperse. They mutilate his young, tender body. Hamid ibn Muslim says, there was so much dust raised that I could not see anything. I could only hear the cries of Hussein. And when the dust settled, I saw Hussein placing his cheek upon the torn chest of Qasim. And he says, oh child, it is unbearable for your old uncle that you call on to him and he does not come to you and to your aid. 
Hamid says, Qasim was rubbing his heels upon the dust. Qasim loses his life. Hussein holds the body of Qasim in his arms. Hamid says, as Qasim's body was brought, his chest was in the arms of Hussein, and his feet were dragging against the dust of Karbala. Hussein brings Qasim and places him next to his Akbar. He takes off his helmet, puts dust upon his head, places one hand on the chest of Akbar and another hand on the chest of Qasim, and then cries out, Oh Allah, I have lost my sons. Allah la'natullah al-qawm al-zalimeen wa siya'alamu al-ladhina zalamu wa yamun qalabin yanqalibun ilahi inna nasaluka bi haqqil Hussein wa jaddihi wa bi wa ummihi wa khi wa tis'ati al-ma'asumina min durriyatihi wa bani Allahumma ghfir lana dunubana wa kaffir anna sayyatina wa tawaffana ma'al abrar Allahumma ajil faraj imamina al-muntadar wa ja'alna min ansarihi wa awanihi wa al-mustashhadina bayna yadayhi Rahamallah man qara al-fatiha do you think women should have the right to make decisions regarding her own body, especially to carry out a full pregnancy when she's unable to care and love for the child? Second follow-up question to that no, is, do you on, think... I, I, sorry, I didn't get that. What, what, what sorry. Do you think women should have the right to make decisions regarding her own body, especially to carry out a full pregnancy when she's unable to care for and love the child? And do you think abortion should be illegal I would like to understand your point of view. Sure. I think that we should not allow a child to come into this world that we can't care for and we can't love. So if people are incapable or not mature enough to bear the responsibility of nurturing children physically and emotionally, then they should think twice, yes, before entertaining that thought. There's nothing worse than to ruin the life of another soul. Two, abortion should not be used as a means of contraception. This is a modern trend which is not right. It is my body, but you invited a guest into your body. Now you just can't say that I will abort it because it's my body and I have a right. So this is the way I phrase it. I will say that's fine. The fetus does not have a right. But your nobility will give the fetus the right to exist. A noble person cannot allow another being to cease to exist. Having said that, if a woman conceives and has legitimate reason to not to carry out the pregnancy, then of course that is perfectly fine and there are mitigating circumstances. Women who are raped, for example, to a certain extent before the coming of the spirit within the womb that the hadith stipulates at four months and our ulama give this fatwa. Or when it is a health risk but legitimate reasons will be mitigating circumstances. And the woman can exercise the right to forego that pregnancy. But it should not be an alternative for contraception. And two, our nobility will not allow for us to cause the cessation of the life of the fetus. We had a, an interactive seminar earlier on about Islam and the relevance of Islam. It was very enlightening to see how our, how our community has progressed, the informed discussions that were taking place and the conclusions that everybody came to. It's recorded, so inshallah the recordings will be available. And please do have more of these seminars, these interactive seminars. They are informal to an extent that we can all engage and discuss and exchange ideas and walk out with clarity in our minds and of course when we share everybody else benefits as well sorry the next question we have Sheikh Arf is could the kitab al-mubin 
be referring to the soul as it seems to be able to give us our morality and innate understanding of how we should be living. I will just make this announcement. The, sorry about this. The Oils Project hope we need to commit ourselves to some service in the name of Imam Hussein to the wider community and humanity. We need to commit ourselves to something or other. It would be an embarrassment if we have to encourage each other to do this, yes? Life is a huge debt. Imam Ali said to Imam Hassan, you are no way capable of bearing this debt. It will become a tribulation upon you on the day of Qiyamah. Give it to others. Let them carry it for you till the day of Qiyamah and you will receive it there in credit as opposed to a debt. Our time is a huge debt. If we give it away in the service of God and humanity, it becomes a credit. Yes? But we should not be in a position to incentivize each other through the carrot of Jannah. Our souls should be beautiful enough to want to do this goodness even if there is no reward at the end of the day. Yes? Two, we always have money collection outside to feed poor people. It's embarrassing to say donate. Yes, It's actually embarrassing. We shouldn't be told. We need to give for the sake of Allah. We say, Oh Allah, feed every hungry stomach. Allah says, you are my hand. You are the one who is going to feed. Let's be the hand of God and to feed hungry stomachs. Sorry, Jai. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. My Asalaam. question is a bit of a follow-up to this one. Um, I'd like to ask you to elaborate on the word uh, kitab or kitab al-mubin as a distinct uh, from the Quran, which we <coughs> use as a revelation, which is to recite. Okay? Yes, yes. Is it indicating a form of divine consciousness? Because if so, then if the Quran is not as static as we largely you know, comprehend or conceive it to be, would that be why the Prophet left us with a parting message that I leave for you my kitab and my itra or sunnah? Yeah. Now, the kitab al mubin appears to be existence in its entirety. Yes? Existence in its entirety is known as the kitab al mubin The words of God means everything that we see. The names of God means everything we see. <clears throat> he is the first, he is the last, he is the apparent, he is the hidden. So kitab al mubin is the existential book. It is reality in its entirety with each one of us inside it or with it, which then expresses itself in words. So the handiwork of God is all of this. The spoken word of God is the book. Yes, this is the animated word of God. That is the static expression or stagnant expression of the animated creative work of God. So Kitab al Mubin appears to be existence in its entirety with its full evolutionary flow. Yes, which suggests itself from time to time. So that is the Kitab al-Mubin. The progeny and the wilayah of the progeny is that agency that derives that fluidity of the Kitab of Quran. Absolutely. Absolutely. Though they are the refined intellects and that was their role to give newer contextual adaptations to the eternal truth. This is a question from a previous day. How do I reconnect with the Quran acknowledging that the form is no longer relevant in today's day and age? Are there sources that you can suggest? I'm going to discuss further tomorrow. I did not say that the form is not relevant. The form is relevant, yes? We need to discuss how certain forms need to be reinterpreted, yes? We need to get it clear. The form of the Qur'an is as relevant today as it has ever been. Certain areas of the form, we will discuss this tomorrow, need to be reinterpreted and there is a method of reinterpreting them. Yes. So we will deal with it tomorrow. Never say that the form of the Qur'an is obsolete or irrelevant. It's not. Otherwise it would not be in the Qur'an. Yeah? There is a very relativistic world out there that we need to deal with. Could the kitab, the book,
be the body of knowledge we call science. It's a portion of it, yes. And another question is, what is your understanding of kumps and zakat in the context of Quran? So, why did Allah impose zakat? Why did God impose khums? Of course, these are taxation systems to govern for the needs of a growing community, right? Welfare, state tax, that's all zakat and khums are. But, given in the name of God, as God recommends with every act, whether devotional or non-devotional, make it a spiritual act by intending God through it. Now people say if you don't make the intention of Qurbatan illallah with zakat, it's not accepted. I will say what? The poor's stomachs are not going to get fed? Of course they are, whether you make the intention or not. The roads are going to be built, the schools are going to be built. What it means is make the intention of God so it works at two levels. One is its physical level of catering for the need of the community and the other one is the spiritual level. So zakat and khums, as discussed by Atullah Marhum Muntazari and, and then Marhum Imam Khomeini, these are welfare and state taxes. There is no merit in any percentage or item upon which they are levied. Have you ever wondered, the Quran talks so excessively about zakat, but does not talk about the entities upon which zakat is levied or the percentage of zakat? Quran doesn't, does it? It doesn't say how much percentage of zakat or on what items take out the zakat because the evolutionary nature of the human community will dictate that different levels of zakat be given at different times of its progression on different items. There are no more camels or goats right now, but we have other forms of wealth, don't we? In Canada, we are giving taxes. They serve as zakat and khums. But we also know the needs of our community within our borders and beyond. So we have a moral and a legal responsibility incumbent upon us to provide for them. So we say, okay, we will uphold the 20% of khums. So give that to the poor. But I do not at all subscribe to this notion of 50% to Sadat and 50% to Ghair Sadat. Sayyid and non Sayyid. This was a contextual necessity at one point when there was a lot of zakat and there was no khums. And there were all these notions that the non Sayyids cannot have zakat. But all of these are hadiths that need to be checked. And maybe we can discuss it at some time. That zakat means to purify. So whatever you take out is filth, right? When you purify something, whatever comes out is filth. So the Sayyid cannot eat filth. That was the Hadith. But the Sayyid can eat the zakat of a Sayyid, so the Sayyid can eat the filth of a Sayyid. So that's why we need to re-examine all these Ahadith. Yes? And then Khums was also a part of the greater zakat. Yes? So these were all contextual things. If the Prophet of Islam came today with a taxation in which he said, the Muslim community will give khums, of which 50% will go to 10 million people, and 50% will go to 190 million people, which soul will be appealed to such a Prophet and his teachings? The Hindus ran away from caste system to come to Islam for an equal and a fair social system. How can you then justify to that Hindu that there is fair social system within Islam when you have this disparity? <clears throat> the thing was that Prophet gave equal shares to everybody, Sahaba and everything. Khalifa Abu Bakr did the same. Khalifa Umar made disparity and distinctions. Khalifa Uthman, obviously he went out of control. Imam Ali came back and gave equal shares and that's why Talha and Zubair and everybody fought against him. The Quran does not make distinctions between a person and a person. Quran refuses to make distinction even on the basis of Islam and non-Islam. He says, O oh people, we have created you from a man and a woman. By mutual interaction you may learn, 
that the best among you is the one who is most God conscious. Islam rids everything off, every one of every distinction. Imam Ali's poem, beautiful. He says, look how Islam has elevated Bilal al-Habashi. And look how Kufr has dropped Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab was a Qurayshi, right? Uncle of the Prophet, right? Being uncle of the Prophet doesn't mean anything. Imam Ali says, look how disbelief has dropped one and how belief has elevated the other. So I do not believe in these portions of homes that are there in the... So I say yes, give homes, give sakat, but we need to be mindful that we give it justly. And of course the Sayyids, you know, they are our masters. Because they are the blood of my prophet. I love them, I'll give my life for them. But the truth of the prophet's teachings prevail beyond my beautiful sentiments to my brothers and sisters who are Sayyids. I would not want to do injustice to their grandfather by not speaking the truth, yeah? as I understand it. Do you have some time for a few more? Yeah, one more. <laughs> is the Quran a conversation between Allah and the Prophet, or is it all exclusively divine revelation? In some places you say, <clears throat> the Prophet says. Can we wait till tomorrow for this? <laughs> I want to discuss this to an extent tomorrow. Yeah? Sure. When Islam is a religion that would promote caring for orphans, why is the mother-son or father-daughter relationship complicated with having to deal with hijab? So, I've written an article on this in which I discuss that adoption in Islam is permissible through the proof of the brotherhood set up by the Prophet in the early Muslim community when they went to Medina. The Prophet initiated the process of muakhat, making two strangers into brothers, in which they mutually inherited each other. Two, there was a form of tabanni, making sons in Islam, within the Jahiliya time. So I argue from there that the Prophet initiated something in order to cater for the need of the young Muslim community because they had lost everything in Makkah. So he gave them new families. And through a process, made it halal or ratified process, he made it legal. So I discuss in that paper that why were the orphan crises in, in Makkah at that time, in Medina, I mean in that region. So now we can adopt an orphan provided there is a legal process in which that orphan can be taken as a child. But with the caveat that when the orphan grows up, they are given a choice if they want to remain in that family or not. So that the autonomy and the right of the, pro the, the, the orphan is not taken away from them. In that pro uh, paper, I also argue that familial ties are not only by blood. They are also by designations. So the Prophet, so the Quran says, La tankahu manakaha abaukum. Do not marry the women that your fathers have married. So now, if a man were to marry a woman for one minute and divorce her, that woman will be no na mahram to that man, but she will become mahram forever to his children. Yes? And they will be, it will be prohibited for them to marry her. That is nothing to do with blood. They didn't even consume the, uh, consummate the marriage. They didn't do anything. It was just a process. So I argue in that paper, citing a lot of these processes, that by making mahram in Islam is not only through blood or consummation of marital relationship, but it also exists through a process. So we can conceive of a process that legitimizes adoption when there is a genuine need for it, just as the Prophet initiated the whole Mu'akhat bond. Yes? You might want to read that paper. Shall we finish that? One last one. Yes. Sheikh Arif, what advice do you have for our sisters who wear hijab and are the first to face Islamophobia? What encouragement can you <clears throat> give them? 
uh, when they face hate and discrimination and are fearful of what could happen to them. You know, I've written a paper on hijab as well. <laughs> Seems like you've written a lot of papers lately. Yeah, don't be sarcastic. <laughs> That's my job. You can read that paper on hijab. Look, if there is Islamophobia, be creative with your hijab, right? Or don't wear that scarf on the head. You, you can't have people hating you and you can't live in fear. This is not Islam, yes? This might appear you know, outrageous, this reply, but read that paper. Islam is about peaceful coexistence. It does not want people to be transgressed upon. Islam does not want a woman to be beaten up, to be sworn at, to be hated. Be creative with your covering, or if you feel that genuinely you can't, then be modest in your dressing, in your behavior, in your conduct. And don't give a hint that you are a Muslim to the extent that people who are those sort of people show their hatred towards you. Allah does not want that. Allah says, He has not made hardship in your religion for you. Yes, think about these things. A woman with a hijab can be immodest. Modesty is something beyond just the covering as well. So if we can't uphold the physical covering, at least the essence of covering uphold that, yes? And whenever you can put the covering back on, when you're not in a surrounding that is Islamophobic, then put it back on, right? Thank you very much, Sheikhar. This is Sayyid Surya Fatiha.